Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our training today. Today, we will be discussing interviewing and hiring. These days, it is more important than ever for leaders to equip themselves with practical skills as well as legal knowledge to effectively select the right applicant and avoid potential litigation. In this training, we will be discussing how interviewers can guard themselves against common mistakes and how an effective interview is properly prepared, conducted, and concluded. My name is Justine Carroll, and I'm a managing consultant with Landrum HR. I have 23 years of experience as a senior human resources professional, and I'm delighted to be your guide today. On behalf of Landrum HR, thank you for joining us. As you can see, we have a full agenda today. But don't worry, although we have a lot of content to cover, we will be sending out materials after the presentation. Now, before we get started, let's start with a poll. Let's see where we all are all now and our comfort level with interviewing. So I'll give you a moment to think about our poll. We're looking for you to tell us what your comfort level is when it comes to interviewing. We have three choices for you. One, I'm terrified. I don't know how to interview. I'm scared I'm gonna ask the wrong questions. I'm okay. I think I've done some interviewing, but I'm not really sure if I'm covering all my bases and if I'm doing it right or I'm a pro, I've done it a million times, I know what I'm talking about, I could teach this webinar. <laughs> so we'll give you a few minutes to think about how you'd like to answer, and then we'll share our responses with you. It's perfectly fine to be terrified, and it's perfectly fine to be a pro. Hopefully this presentation will give you tips and tricks for all levels of expertise in this area. Interviewing is like a muscle. You have to exercise it for it to be effective. So we're gonna close the voting here in just a couple minutes. Okay, our poll results are up. And it's about as I expected. We've got about 3% that are terrified of interviewing, 71% feeling pretty okay about it, but maybe looking for some additional um, tips and tricks and, and things to avoid. And then I've got 26 people who are a pro. Good for you. I'm excited for you to be part of our presentation today. Let's move on. So let's talk about what an interview is. Now, we've all been in an interview. We've either participated in one as a leader of an interview or we've experienced an interview ourselves. The purpose of an interview is obviously to find out information, right? We want to find out about the candidate and whether or not they're going to fit in our organization, they're going to fit that job, and that they're going to be a match for that culture, department, um, and our overall synergy as a company. But it's not a one-way street. An interview is really a holistic experience between an organization and the candidate. The candidate is also interviewing you. And I think that can often be overlooked because you really want them to see what it would be like to join your organization. You want them to experience the environment that they might be in, what that position is really like. Can they see themselves there? So we want to be sure that we're providing the right information in that interview. We are being interviewed as well. And I think that that's an important point. You're going to hear me talk a lot today about the candidate experience. And I think it's a good point to keep in mind, especially in this very challenging market for recruitment and retention. We wanna be sure that the experience that the candidate is getting is not only accurate, we are telling them the right information about the job and the organization, but we're really giving them a true picture of what it will be like to work with you. Now, the key to a good interview is not just a skill set match. Most jobs, we know that if they're applying for the job, they are either partially, mostly, or definitely 
um, equipped with the right skills to be successful in the job as it relates technically. But the part where most employers and recruiters fall off is trying to make sure that personality culture match is really there. Because oftentimes we can teach someone the skills that we need, particularly in an entry level job or a beginner level of, of a position. But it's very difficult to teach these soft skills, the compatible styles of communication, the ability to take direction, the acceptance of criticism that's constructive, helping them be better at their job, their commitment to task. Will they show up and complete the job? Will they show up and make sure that um, every day they're going to be there? So that's really the, the parts that we're trying to dig into in an interview. We're really trying to get behind the language of the resume and find out more about who they really are and how they will be on the job with you. So let's get started and some of our topics that we're going to talk today. Let's talk first about the phone interview. Phone interviews are a great tool. I really, really like them for a lot of different reasons. It's a great way to make sure that your candidate is within the ballpark of what you're looking for. And many organizations call that meeting the mandatory minimums of a job. But oftentimes in this very uh, fast moving market, as well as unpredictable job offers that come out of nowhere sometimes for candidates that you're very interested in, a phone interview can slow down the process. Um, so there's a lot of pros and cons to a phone interview. On the good side, you have getting the, the chance to make sure you're in the ballpark as far as expectations for salary, being on site at a job or being remote, getting those bare basics in to know that whether or not this person's a good fit before you invite other individuals from your um, in, from your organization into that interviewing process. Because we all know that interviewing face-to-face, -face, whether it is in person or on a Zoom call, can be time consuming for an, for an organization. So we wanna make sure that we've got at least the basics down for um, that person knowing that that candidate is pretty much in the right ballpark for the position that we're considering them for. But given the speed that this market is moving in now, we don't want to lose out on a very important candidate. So what I'm seeing in terms of best practices these days is making a cutoff in terms of we're using phone interviews for more complex organizational positions. So positions that are going to be interacting, supervisor positions, um, things that have a lot of cross-functional um, access. You may see more phone interviews be useful at that level before you're bringing in higher level individuals to be part of that interviewing process, where I'm seeing organizations trending towards entry-level jobs, getting in the door and seeing that they can do the job and show up. So it's just a thought to think of when you're thinking, when you're considering what a phone interview would be useful for you and your organization. So let's talk about preparing for the interview. This is the part where I call doing your homework. You've got to be prepared for your interview. You want to make sure you've got all your tools ready. So you're seeing there on the screen, I've got three things that we're going to talk about here. But they're all related to advanced preparation and, like I said, doing your homework. So if you're having an in-person interview or you're having a Zoom call interview, make sure you've got all your tools around you. You wanna make sure that you've got the right tools to get in contact. Your phone is working, your internet's on. Um, I am not a very technological person, so I always test my connections a lot. Today I practiced a lot to make sure that the connection was good for technology because I wanted to make sure that I was going to reach my audience. It's the same idea when you're reaching a candidate. You want to be sure you've got all your tools there. If you're going to write notes, you've got a notebook. Um, we're going to talk about um, a little bit more about the notes that you're going to be taking here in a little bit. But you want to be sure that you've got everything available to you to have the right tools. You want to be sure that you are prepared. Now, there's a lot to being prepared in terms of your knowledge and what you're going to say. Preparation is not just, I've got my resume out, good to go. I'm just going to go down the resume. You want to have the most successful interview. You want to be sure that you've taken the time to review the resume, that you've flagged certain things that you want to talk about with the candidate, that you've 
created your interview questions in advance. And in a little bit, we're going to talk about the difference between having your questions ready in advance as part of a behavioral interviewing, which is what we're going to talk about, or the traditional type of interviewing where the conversation just sort of goes with the flow. You go down the resume, you're just sort of talking to them. And there's pros and cons to both. I'm a bigger fan of behavioral interviewing, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the interview questions. Making sure you are prepared and having those knowledge, having those questions already sort of set up and ready to go prepares you for a lot of different parts of the interview. For one, you've got your details together in terms of where you're going with your conversation. You've got your information ready, you know what you want to ask them, and you're ready to have that conversation. You're not just seat of the pants, asking what you're thinking of right in that moment. The other part about being prepared for the interview is avoiding distractions and talking too much. Now, there are always distractions in our daily lives. We don't want to use that time to be checking text messages or checking email. I see a lot of this happening, especially on Zoom calls. You'll know when someone is not paying attention to you, right? They're looking down at their lap. They're sort of staring into space. You know, they're looking at emails. And in an interview, again, we're talking about the in candidate experience. We want to be sure that they have our full focus. So making sure that they know that we're there to talk to them and find out about them is really what we're trying to spend our time on. So you want to make sure that, you know, your dogs, your kids, your significant other, Others, if you're doing a Zoom interview, that they're not blundering into it. You want to, want to let them know, hey, I'm going to be on a call. Please don't come in. Or if you're in person, make sure that you found a place where you're not going to be disturbed, where people aren't just going to poke their head in really quick and, hey, God, I got five minutes. Oh, I didn't know someone was in here. You want to be sure that you're giving the candidate your full focus. Some of the other things that I see a lot when, especially with seasoned interviewers, is the talking, right? We get very excited about our organization and our company. And we want to tell them all about it and we want to give them information and we want to answer their questions really, really well if they're talking to us in the interview. But remember, this, this time we're spending with the candidate is to learn about them. And unwittingly, we may be giving away what our answers, what answers we'd like to see are if we're talking too much. So we want to be sure that we're taking the time to let them answer, using that silence to your advantage and not over talking. So you're making sure that you're not telling too much about what you're trying to uh, share about the organization and letting them tell you about themselves. Now, I know it's hard to do, right? We don't like silence. It makes everybody anxious. You're sitting there and it's very uncomfortable and you just sort of blunder into it, right? You're like, oh, I need to cover up on the silence. Let's move on to the next question. It's okay. Give them a minute to process the question. Don't over talk over them. Give them a chance to, to think about it and talk on it. Now, another good reason to be set up and doing the homework that we talked about a second ago is the structure of the interview, right? So you want to be sure that you have a plan. And this plan is very important so you can make sure that you're getting all the same information from all of the candidates that you're speaking with. Now, ideally, you're giving them a little bit of information about the company, you're giving them some information about the role, and then you're diving into information about themselves. So you don't wanna oversell the company, you don't wanna oversell anything, you wanna get information from them but it's easy to get off track. So that's why preparing for the interview and having that structure is going to be important. You wanna be sure that you're asking all the candidates the same questions. So later you can evaluate them all the same way. You don't wanna have certain information from one candidate and then you never asked the other candidate about that. And oh, I meant to tell them about how this role is gonna be remote in a month. Oops, I told that one, but I didn't tell this one. You want to be sure that you have, again, done your homework and you've created either a checklist or you have an idea in your mind so you know how to stay on track. Now, the importance of staying on track in an interview is that people are people, right? And many times when you're in an interview, you can get off track. You, your, your candidate that you're talking to starts 
going down a rabbit hole and they get off track with the conversation with a segue that is not exactly what you thought the conversation was going to go, or they say something very surprising and reveal something that you want to discover a little bit more completely, or they say something that sort of alarms you a little bit and you're thinking to yourself, wow, I I'm not really sure why they said that. I, maybe I, I'm not sure about that. So you want to be sure that you're prepared for that unexpected um, segue that can happen in an interview. You just never know where a candidate's going to go. So having done your homework, having your checklist, having a plan structure for the interview, having your questions written down, is going to help keep you on track. It's going to keep you flowing in the interview in the direction that's going to, again, give you the most information from the candidate. So again, it's a, it's a two-way process, so you don't wanna just cut them off, but if they are sort of spiling around and you don't know where they're going, you can gently redirect them I, you know, by saying something to the effect of, you know, that's fascinating, Susie. I really appreciate you sharing that with me. Let's get back to my question. Just gently redirecting them back. So again, you're giving them a chance to share about themselves, but at the same time, you're making sure their candidate experience does not seem too rigid. You don't want to cut them off and then they don't have a chance to really talk and they're thinking to themselves, gosh, they don't, they don't really want to hear what I have to say. Sometimes you have to redirect them. Sometimes you need to get them back on track in a little bit more um, robust manner. So that's going to be the judge for you in that circumstance. But if you haven't done your homework, it's very easy to get dragged along with them. And before you know it, you've lost track of where you want it to be and you don't know what you meant to ask them. You don't know if you've asked them the question you want to ask them about working remotely or, or you know, do they have that skill set? So questions and homework, make sure you take care of them. Now, the follow-up, that's the part that people always forget about. After you have the interview, you want to be sure that, again, you've got all your documentation together, all your notes. Don't take the notes on the resume. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that, but just a friendly reminder, make sure that your notes um, are on a separate piece of paper and always be aware that your notes can be discoverable. So please make sure that you're writing only appropriate comments in there that are related to objective features about the candidate. Um, you don't want to trail off into uh, characteristics um, that are inappropriate because those notes um, can be shared with anybody. So please keep that in mind. You also want to make sure that you're following up with the candidate in terms of, you know, what those next steps are going to be. You don't want to leave them out there hanging. That is the biggest black hole that I see right now in trends, why candidates re don't refer other candidates to a job that they may have liked the company, but it wasn't a good fit for them at the time. They, they have this sense of, I went off into a black hole. I never heard from them again. They never told me I was or wasn't selected. So you do want to make sure that you've completed the loop. If they're not the right candidate, please let them know. If they are, if somebody that you think you might invite back for next steps of interview, don't make promises. Just let them know. My, um, you know, Sally will be in connecting with you later to talk about next steps um, in our process something very vague, but they know that you will be in contact with them and then make sure that if that individual is not you, that that person is following up. Okay, so let's talk about how you actually interview. Now, behavioral-based interviews, which I did talk a little bit about beforehand when, and early on when we talked about them, is a particular type of interview style and it's very successful in getting a sense of how that individual will interact and be in your organization. So it's going to give you past clues based on their past performance about how they may behave in certain situations at your organization. So you're getting a glimpse into their judgment, um, which is why you're asking them about a specific time or a situation or a behavior and conduct that they um, participated in and what that outcome was. So it's not a it's not a glass, it's not a crystal ball. <laughs> it's not a crystal ball by any means. It's not going to necessarily tell you exactly what they're going to do. Because again, we're not talking about robots, we're talking about people. And certain circumstances are going to play into that. But it is going to give you an understanding of how they may manage themselves, how their decision-making process goes, and then how they um, how they work with others. 
So I mentioned a little bit earlier the difference between a traditional interview and these behavioral interviews. Now, traditional interviews can be great, but they definitely can give you not enough information. You may find yourself with deficits or gaps where you don't have enough information to take a well-informed decision about what candidate is going to be best for you. With a behavioral interview, you're going to be asking them all the same questions. So you will have more of an apples to apples comparison for these candidates. Um, it, you know, people like traditional interviews because it's a sort of go with the flow, right? You don't feel like it's so rigid and I'm going to ask you these questions. So a lot of times employers and, and uh, you know, interviewers, recruiters, they really like that conversational flow. As you're talking, you're asking more questions as you're going. But again, you're not getting the chance to get the same information from the same candidates. So you may miss out on, oh, gosh, I didn't know that I, I missed that on that person. Even if you have your list and your checklist, you may miss that. So you also want to be sure that, um, you know, and we're going to talk about the legal piece here in a moment, but traditional interviewing can put you a little bit at risk. And let me tell you why. When you're having this go with the flow, this conversational, you may go off and get a lot of different types of information there. But the problem is, is that by venturing off into territory um, that is not consistent, you may find yourself sometimes in um, shaky ground with what the candidate is revealing, or sometimes the tone of the conversation changes a little bit, and that could open you up to legal challenges because maybe they reveal something that you weren't expecting. And now you're sitting in the conversation with them and they wanna talk to you about uh, potentially maybe a medical condition that they have. And they're going on and on and on about it. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to get out of this conversation. I don't know how I got into it. What do I do now? And then as time goes on, you select another candidate, not because of the medical condition, but maybe they have a skill set that you really, really need, which would be like, I don't know, let's just for conversation's sake say it's like a software programming skill, C++, something like that, right? So one candidate has C++. The candidate that revealed this medical condition doesn't have C++. So, you know, you went with the C++ candidate. Now, the other candidate that you had the traditional interview with may think that you didn't select them because of this medical condition. So, again, it, you opened yourself up a little bit to some, some concerns. And so we want to be sure that we're not opening doors that we can't close by keeping on a behavioral interview and doing our homework at the, at the beginning, we can make sure that we're reducing those legal challenges because sometimes they happen and they will come out of the blip. They always do. So it's definitely important to keep in mind the different types of interviews. Now, when we're talking about behavior-based interviews, we're generally focused in these five areas, teamwork orientation, problem solving, how they um, take initiative or what their leadership qualities are, um, interpersonal skills, and then how they manage themselves under pressure or stress. So it's important that we're asking questions that are the how and the why. So you'll see some, some examples here on your screen. Now don't worry, as I mentioned in the beginning, you will have materials after this, part, after this presentation that you'll be able to reference. So don't worry about trying to write these down really quick. They, you will have some access to these later. But these are some examples of where um, the how and the why become important. Tell me about a time when you had to delegate a task. Give me an example of how you showed initiative and took the lead. Describe a situation. These are all open-ended questions that are going to give you the kind of information that tells you what kind of interview, excuse me, what kind of candidate that this interviewee will be when they're actually in um, your organization. Again, it's not a crystal ball. They're not going to tell you exactly what it is. However, it is going to give you an idea of their decision-making process, their judgment, how they go about challenging stress and things of that nature. So these very revealing questions will help you determine that. Now, of course, in behavioral interviews, you are going to have different levels of questions or different types of um, direction depending on the level of individual that you're interviewing. So an individual contributor 
your questions may be focused more on the task itself or the skill set, right? How did you learn this? What do you know about that? Give me an example of when you've used this, um, this skill set, right? But with a supervisor, those questions are going to be probably more based upon leadership style, their communication, um, how they inspire their, their teams, you know, what kind of decision making processes do they make in certain circumstances that could be questionable or problematic. So you can gauge and change these behavioral questions based on the type of interview that you're looking to have. But it is important, again, to realize you're trying to get at the information that's going to help you make an informed decision about your candidate. Now, the types of questions that we're looking to avoid are those closed type of questions. So these are some examples of those um, types of questions. So obviously a closed question, a yes or a no response, right? We don't, we don't, if we just say, have you done this? And they say, yes. <laughs> that doesn't really tell you anything, right? You don't know if they know anything other than that. And it's awkward. Sometimes people get anxious to say, can you tell me a little bit more about that? So you want to gauge your question in a manner that it opens the door for them to tell you more about it. Um, a leading question. You don't want to impose the answer on them in the question, right? And that can be very easy to do. You don't want to be giving the answer away in the question. What you're looking for is an authentic answer from the candidate. So you can figure out, are they a good fit for us? Um, the double-headed question, obviously those are the double negatives. Those trip me up all the time. So you definitely want to make sure that you're not asking the, the, the double negatives. Um, they're always confusing and it leads the candidate just to kind of sit there and, and then you get off track and you've got this awkward silence and everyone's kind of staring at each other. So you definitely don't want to do the double-headed question. Multiple choice questions, very similar to the leading questions. Um, you and you tend to limit their responses because you're saying, could it be this or is it this? Could it be this or is it this? And they're thinking, maybe those are the only answers that are acceptable. So maybe I shouldn't go outside of those answers. So maybe I won't answer that question. Or you're giving them hints. Again, unknowingly, you want the, them to have be comfortable but you don't want to give them the answer. So again, multiple choice questions can be um, it can be a little bit misleading in terms of getting the information that you're looking for. Again, the authentic answer from your candidate. The hypothetical questions. Now, everybody's prepared for these these days. These used to be the killer questions in an interview, right? You'd be like, uh, what carnival animal would you be? What merry-go, uh, you know, what, what would you choose if you're going to ride on the merry-go-round? Those types of hypothetical questions, um, in, you know, employers used to feel like gave them a lot of insight into, um, you know, into what the candidates' responses and what their psyche was. It really doesn't. People are ready for those questions now. So they've got a prepared response. So again, you're not getting that authentic answer that you're looking for that will help them really share who they are and help you make a decision, um, again, an educated and informed decision about who the best candidate is for your job and your position. Okay, so let's talk about the legal troubles, right? That's the big scary thing. We don't know what to ask. We don't know what we can ask. We don't know what we can't ask. And, you know, there's a lot of laws out there and we don't have enough time today to go into every single one. But that is um, something that we can offer later in, in a separate presentation. But what I want to leave you with is that the big ones, the big five are under Title VII Act of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So these particular uh, categories, the sex, race, color, national origin, religion in certain states, gender identification, um, sexual orientation, depending on the state that you're in, um, or municipality. Um, these are the big ones you wanna stay away from, right? And it seems very obvious, right? You wouldn't normally ask these questions, but the way sometimes a question that is valid that you're trying to seek information about is presented could appear to be a discriminatory job question for a job candidate. So again, this sort of goes back to the homework and it definitely goes back to the candidate experience that we've been talking about. So you wanna be sure that if it seems like it might be, you know, a, a questionable question, don't ask it, 
you know, there are plenty of ways to ask and get at the information that you're looking for, but I would definitely stay away from these areas. Stay away from questions about pregnancy. Um, that's also another big one, you know, and I know people want to know, right? As an employer, you're like, well, if they're pregnant and I hire them and then they're out and it's like not even having hired for that job. Believe me, I understand where you're coming from. It is very difficult not only to find a candidate, just to have them go out again. However, stay away from those questions. There are very serious federal laws that protect pregnancy. So again, that's the other big one, stay away from. So let's talk a little bit more about these types of questions. Now, you're gonna see a big chart here, right? And there's a lot of information on this chart. So I'll tell you again, don't worry about writing it all down. Don't worry about trying to take a snapshot of it. We do have materials after the presentation for you to reference, but you'll see on the left side here that you have some of those things that we were talking about, age, sex, marital status, sexual orientation. Those are all the big ones that we were just talking about, and we have a few more on the next page that I'll get to. And it seems obvious, right? You don't want to be asking, so how old are you? You know better, right? You're not asking that. However, you may be a little bit curious about, well, are they looking to retire soon? Maybe, maybe not. But a better way to ask that question might be, um, tell me a little bit about your career trajectory. Where do you see yourself going in the next three to five years? That's going to give you good information about whether or not you think this person might retire. So again, you don't want to open yourself up to trouble by asking an obvious question. Now, a lot of these questions, um, again, seem like I would never ask that, but it's very easy to get caught up in trying to get at the information that you're looking for or accidentally asking the information in a way that's not the way you meant, but that's how it was interpreted, um, especially uh, around the national origin and ancestry, um, especially if your position has a language component to it, then you want to know if, um, let's say this job that you're advertising for um, and that you're recruiting for has a Spanish component and this person is um, needs to speak Spanish to be successful in this position. You don't wanna ask them, so is Spanish your first language? You don't wanna ask them that. You can ask them, one of the uh, mandatory requirements for this job is being fluent in Spanish. Do you feel that you can meet that job requirement? That is the legal way you can ask it. So you just have to think a little bit about a better way to ask it. You can still get to the information that you're looking for, but you have to be a little bit careful about how you're going about getting to that information. So we're gonna have a little poll here going to see how well you've been listening. Remember, you're not going to get in trouble for the wrong answers, but I want to see how we're coming along here in our journey here together. So I'm going to open a poll that is going to ask you a question about lawful or unlawful. So here is a question that is up. You're trying to decide if it's lawful or unlawful. Do you have a car in working order in order to get to this position to, to get to, to, to work. I'll give you a few minutes to, to get in there. I know it's a little bit tricky. Hopefully you've been listening along. I know it's worded very properly. You want to know if they can get to work and if they will be able to report to work. Okay, we're going to close the poll here in just a couple minutes. Well, seconds really. <laughs> So I'm seeing a lot of changes, some people thinking about it, maybe changing their minds. I know it's a tricky one. These are hard questions. And that's the point, right? We want to make sure that you know how to interview properly. All right, we're going to close the poll here. All right. Look at my good listeners, 72% uncompliant, 28% legal. It's a tricky question, and that's why I asked it. So what you're really getting at here, and I tried to give you a hint, is that you want to know if they're going to show up to work, right? You want to know, can they come to work? Will they be there um, every day? Are they going to get to work? And we have a rural operation, or we have um, a place downtown that has no parking. And are, do you have a car to get to work? I know you want to ask. 
a better way to ask it because you can't ask them if they have a car. And I also gave you a little bit of a cheater down in the second column there on Lawful. It says, do you own a car? Shh, I was trying to give you a hint. Anyway, so the reason that you cannot ask about why it's whether or not they own a car is because it may discriminate you against their financial their financial situation. And we don't want to make having a car an obligation for an employee to, to get a good job unless it is a bona fide requirement of the job, like they are a delivery person that is required to offer their own car, like a pizza delivery person, something like that. Now, a better way to get to that information because again we want to know if they're going to show up is you know this job requires you to be on site eight to five monday through friday are you able to meet that expectation you can ask them that straight out perfectly legal but you cannot ask them about the car all right good job all right are we ready for the next question okay we're going to open another poll i see you went to the same college as my brother he was there in 1992 is that when you were there? Well, let me know what you think about this one. Again, it's a little bit tricky. And I've got some additional information that will come with it. So go ahead and weigh in. Let me know if you think it is compliant or legal. You're just making conversation. Just asking. Just wanted to know. Just notice it was the same college. All right, so we're going to close the poll here in just a minute. All right. You guys are getting on to me. You're good listeners. <laughs> I love doing these polls. I think it's so much fun to figure out better ways to answer questions and, you know, get to the, get to the good stuff when you're in an interview. All right, our poll is now closed. You guys are smart. 85% uncompliance, correct. Now, this question is a little bit tricky because obviously, and I gave you a little bit of a hint because we did talk about age in the last slide, but when you're talking to an individual and you're just making conversation, that's still part of the interview process. That, quite honestly, is the most dangerous time of the interview process in total. When you're walking them into the interview, that chit chat that happens before the official interview starts, that's when it's most dangerous because you're just making conversation and you may end up, you know, talking to someone about something that you didn't mean to and putting yourself at risk about, um, you know, putting your organization at risk and you just wanted to make some casual conversation. So. Again, don't don't look too deep into it, but you guys are doing a great job being very, very good listeners. All right, I have one more for you. This one is a toughie. I'm gonna open one more poll. Okay. I see you're out of work for a while. Was that because of a medical condition? This is a tough one because remember, we do have COVID right now. So keeping that in mind, is this something that you would want to ask them? I see you're out of work for a while. Was it because of a medical condition? Go ahead and weigh in. Let me know what you think. It's a tough one, especially during this COVID time. It's hard to know, you know where to draw the line and if this is something you can be asking individuals when you're looking at their resume and wanting to know. Okay, we're going to close the poll here in just a minute. Again, just a minute. It's such a funny colloquialism. Okay, just about there. Oh my goodness, I think you guys might be on to me. I'm looking at the results come in. Poll is closed, 98% uncompliance. Good job. You guys are onto my, in, onto my game right now. Yes, that is an uncompliant question. That is a very difficult one, especially during COVID right now, um, because a lot of individuals have been out of work and, you know, they have a lot of unaccounted for time in the interview or excuse me, in their resume. And the reason that I brought this question up specifically and I referenced it earlier in the presentation is that this type of question can bring you down the road where you don't want to be right. You're going to they may voluntarily voluntarily give you information of, oh, well, I was out of work from here to here because 
I was, you know, in the middle of, um, you know, taking care of my spouse or I was sick or, or whatever. When that happens in a conversation, you definitely want to steer the conversation away from that type of information. You want to focus on their skill set and their experience, not, um, not uh, any kind of medical condition. You can say nice things like, um, I appreciate you sharing that. Let's get back to um, talking about and have a question prepared. Again, having your homework ready to stay on track. I think it's really important. A lot of times people are very open about that, which I, I appreciate and I think can be very useful, especially if there have been big gaps in a resume. You do kind of want to know that, but you really don't want to know because you don't want to have any decisions that are going to be based on that. So great job on those legal questions. You guys are stars. All right, so let's talk a little bit about body language. It's often one of those most missed pieces of uh, the interview process. And I do find that um, it's obvious when you're in person and it's less obvious when you're on video. So I think that that's the, the challenge that we have right now, right? Because we see a lot of people on the video and we can't really tell if they're really engaged unless they're you know, looking at their phone, checking email, that kind of thing. But when you're doing an in-person interview um, and even when you're on a Zoom call, being engaged um, physically from a body language perspective is really important. And I, I look at it, um, I like this chart because I think it really sort of puts it um, in perspective of how people communicate because humans communicate on a nonverbal um, plane as well as a verbal plane. So when you're getting the information from the candidate, right, you're getting the information in a verbal perspective from the words, right? You're hearing what they are saying about their experience and their skill set and all of those things. That's all very important. But you also want to make sure that your body language, going back to the candidate experience, is inviting as well. So you want to be making sure that your body language, your orientation is inviting for them to share. If you have mannerisms um, that are preventing and blocking that um, energy from, you know, that information from flowing, that could, again, be prohibiting you from getting additional information. So in an in-person interview, that's something like you know, not having a desk between you when you have someone come in for an interview. You're sitting behind the desk and they're sitting in the chair. And I think it creates barriers, right? It's an artificial barrier between getting a synergy going with the candidate and trying to really get to know who they are and what they're trying to tell you. Um, if you have options, I always say you should sit near the candidate or next to them. Now, not next to them. I don't mean it like that. What I mean is if you have chairs or a desk in your um, or a, a sitting area in your office, I usually encourage my employers to sit, do something like that and sit in that type of sitting arrangement because you're then more um, in tune with that individual and you're sharing a space with them to make sure that you're getting good information and that it's an open conversation your posture is important. And I find this especially important on Zoom calls. When you see someone way back, are they really engaged in the conversation or are they leaning forward and they want to talk to you and they're interested? You know, are they talking to you like this the whole time and they're, and they're um, you know, they've got some, some artificial barriers in their physicality. Um, eye contact is always a big one. Facial expressions. Do you really are? Do you have a, a a resting expression that invites them to continue to talk to you, or do you look like you're just trying to get out of there? You know, kind of, mm, mm, you know, you don't want to be doing that um, as a physically. Now, again, you're listening, but you may be unknowingly um, discouraging your candidate from really sharing fully with you the information that you're looking to get. Um, the volume and the pitch and the tempo that you're speaking in also very important. Um, hand gesture is very important. If you are a loud talker, you know, or like Kramer says on Seinfeld, I know I'm dating myself, but a close talker. You know, some of those things, obviously with COVID, the close talking not as has kind of gone away a little bit, but people are also hungry for physical interaction. Um, and if they're starting up to do, if your organization is starting to do um, in-person interviews again, People like to see people again, right? And so you may find people a little bit in your space. And with the COVID, people are a little bit unnerved by that. So just make sure that you're creating an a environment where you're inviting them in to talk, but you're not um, you know, discouraging them um, in your mannerisms. I think that that's really important. 
So let's talk a little bit about our judgment, how we start making decisions about which candidate is going to work best for us. So it's really easy to fall into a lot of these. Now you'll see a couple here on here that I bet look familiar to you, but we're going to go through them just to make sure um, that you see the, what we're talking about here. So that first impression, that first uh, two minutes can really make or break an interview, right? As a hiring manager or person that's in charge of recruiting, you want to be sure that you're not letting that first impression steer you away because some people are very nervous when they first come into an interview. They talk too much or they don't talk at all or they're very introverted and it takes them a while to warm up or they come out of the gate really loud and you can't let that initial um, impression color the entire interview. You need to give people a chance to get into their rhythm. They can start answering questions, they're going to get into some content about themselves that they feel familiar with, and so you're going to have a much better understanding of who they actually are. But if you start off right away and you're like, mm, I did not like the way they mumbled or they, you know, just sort of attacked me in the interview or, you know, whatever it might be, give them a chance. Listen to the entire interview. Go through your checklist. Make sure that you know you're you're really covering off on all of the same questions, so you can give them a chance to to settle down and or come out of their shell. Um, stereotyping a really big one, and I know everyone's like, not me. I don't stereotype. People do. It's human nature. We all have internal biases, um, and they're natural biases on a lot of accounts. You buy a Honda because you know it's reliable. That's not what I'm talking about. But you sometimes it's easy to get swayed by. Um, by something somebody says, a language choice they use. Um, and I'm not talking about discriminatory language choice. I'm just talking about maybe the way they talk, right? Um, or it's a shoe that they're wearing or something to that effect. So you don't want to let your internal bias about a particular item wipe away all of the other information that you're going to get in that particular um, interaction with that candidate. By that same token, don't get swayed into the just like me. It's very easy to hire someone who's very charismatic and they seem very much like you. And so you're like, oh, wow, we have a lot in common. I bet he's going to do or she's going to do their job just like me. I bet they're going to be a great candidate. They like to sail. Me too. Maybe. They are like you and in similar ways. But again, it's better off to make sure that you go through your checklist, you go through your prepared questions to make sure. Because just because they may like sailing like you doesn't mean they maybe have the same work ethic you do. So again, making sure that you're treating everybody consistently across the board. Halo and horns, I know it sounds funny, right? Um, that basically is just taking one particular characteristic about an individual and either using it to think they're amazing, the halo, or use that to say that, you know, they're just not for me. That's not the good candidate. You, again, want to make sure that you are holistically looking at the, at the candidate as a whole person based on all of the answers that they've given you for the questions, all of the experience that they have on their resume, and all of your interaction with them. So don't let one particular characteristic steer you off base. Contrasting, that's a tough one, right? Because you know that we're contrasting the candidates anyway. But what contrasting really means in this sense is, let's say you have a spectacular interview with Jose right? He's amazing. He's meeting all of the boxes. You really, really liked him. Paul comes in, same exact skill set, but not as charismatic, maybe a little bit quieter, maybe a little bit different in the way that he communicates, but you just had this spectacular interview with Jose. Paul, by comparison, is going to seem less spectacular just because Jose was so great. So you want to be sure that, again, you are falling back on your list of, of criteria that you're judging um, the knowledge, skill, and ability on and not getting too swayed, again, by that spectacular interview. You want to be sure that you're really comparing apples and apples, oranges and oranges across the board. Now, are your candidates going to be different? Absolutely. Are some of them going to be better than others? Yes. And depending on the type of position that you're interviewing for, it may be relevant. But just be careful about that one. That one definitely gets you. Um, focus on the end results and not the approach. That and the assumptions about the intent. That's, um, you know, you get a lot of that when you're talking about somebody who's a great performer. Maybe it's sales or maybe it's some other um, particular position that meets metrics. 
And yes, they get all those things done. They're meeting their numbers. They're, they're getting it done. But they are burning all the bridges in the process of making that happen. And so it's tearing down communication in the group and the department and the company, that kind of thing, um, based on, you know, their communication style, right? So they're telling you, oh, I was the best at this and that, whatever, and it was just me and I was a solo artist. Okay, you know, that can be good. But that, you know, that end result is is not the only thing you need to be considering, the approach is very important because you want to have the camaraderie. You want to make sure that this person is not going to burn down your organization when they get in there. Now, the assumption about intent that goes with that to say, you know, you don't want to be like, well, the only reason they did that was because X. You're assuming that the reason that they burned that bridge down was because they were just trying to get to the to end result of the metrics. Maybe, or maybe they have problems communicating and collaborating with others. It's hard to say. So again, just making sure that you're making a quality judgment and you're taking in all the information that's presented to you to make an educated decision. Now, let's talk a little bit about social media and recruitment. I know it's out there and I know it is very tempting. You want to go on their LinkedIn page. You want to go on um, Facebook. You want to look them up in Google and just see what's going on. Unless they have given you their LinkedIn page, it is my recommendation that you try and stay away from social media as it relates to recruitment. It just opens the door to too many slippery slopes as it relates to um, you know, protecting your business and making a decision that's based on concrete, objective reasons about this particular candidate. I would stick with the information that you have as much as possible. Um, you know, the application they filled out, the resume they provided, any skills tests that they have done. Um, if they invite you to their um, LinkedIn page, then sure, I, I think it's fine to go there. Most resumes these days have it in that top right hand corner or somewhere on the resume that invite you to go there. Go there. Don't go anywhere else. Don't start trolling around. It really puts you in a precarious position. Um, and I've seen a lot of organizations have um, a bad outcome as it relates to that. So just a quick thought about that. Try to resist the urge. I know it's out there, but I really don't recommend you going on there. And I know you want to know, kind of want to know what this person's like. Try and get as much information as you can out of the interview. Okay, so let's start talking about making those decisions and how we do that. So when you're making your decision, again, you're trying to assess all the information that came in here, right? You're trying to say, okay, did they research us? Are they excited about us? Did they ask me any questions um, about our organization? Or are they just looking for a job? So you want to be sure that you're assessing their um, uh, you know, excitement in your organization, that they've asked you some knowledgeable questions about it. You want to know if they're looking for a job or if they're looking for a career. You want to be sure that you're avoiding some of those pitfalls that we've talked about. You know, you want to make sure that you're following that that strong candidate. You're not stereotyping against those, um, you know, biases that we all have just internally and you're getting sucked into their charisma. We want to be sure we're making an objective, informed decision. Um, a lot of times that happens also with generational affiliation. You know, this younger generation does X and this older generation always does Y. Probably not actually the best way to make a decision. I know, sounds crazy. But you definitely want to be sure that you're assessing each candidate based on the information that you have in front of you, not because you know that Gen Z or, or the Gen Z Alpha or the Boomers, they act this way. Everybody is different and you want to be sure that you're evaluating this candidate based on your experience with them and the information that you have gotten. Um, interviewing when they came in, you know, are they on time? You know, all these little things add up in terms of, you know, did they talk negatively about their other boss? Um, you know, were they respectful of your staff? You know, when they talk to you or other people on your team, did they give the same respect? All very important things in your decision making process. Talking about, you know, some of reviewing some of these things that we've been talking about, those nonverbal cues, you know, it's really easy to get off track with that. Um, don't give them unfair or unrealistic expectations about those next steps. I know it can be hard when you have a spectacular interview with someone, you're like, 
I, I think this is going to go really well. We're definitely going to call you next week with an offer. But you still have three more candidates. Make sure that you're being realistic about that interviewing um, and what that next step looks like. We have three more candidates to interview. Um, Sally will be in touch on next steps. Thank you so much for coming out and, and sharing um, your time with us today. So again, making sure that you're making an informed decision after you've seen everybody. And you will, again, have candidates that don't fit the bill, but you do want to make sure that you're making an informed decision based on information, not um, just a gut reaction. As I mentioned earlier, behavioral interviewing is definitely one of my favorite types of interviewing. I definitely feel like it gives you a broader insight into the type of candidate that you're going to be getting. It's focusing on those objective factors that help you make a good decision. Um, and if you're using your active listening skills and you're using your nonverbal um, cues to, to get that information, you know, leaning in, inviting them into, into, your, um, into your workspace, not using artificial barriers like desks, you're going to get more information out of these candidates, and then you're going to be able to make an informed decision. We talked a little bit about this, so I'm not going to belabor it too much, but don't forget about the holistic candidate experience. Even once you've made your decision, and we're going with Sally on this position, make sure that you're following her through the process. Her offer letter comes across properly. Her orientation is set up. Her um, onboarding goes smoothly. We're giving her the tools and the training um, and making sure that they have everything to be successful. It's very easy to be like, hired them. Good luck. So you want to be sure that, again, the candidate experience from start to finish, the minute they walk in the door with you till their first day with you and even after that, um, is going to be a positive one because employees, no good employees. So we want to be sure that not only are we setting them up for success, but we're also maybe getting another source of recruitment for other positions that we might have to, to fill. And again, replacing an employee can be expensive. So we want to be sure that we are making good choices because it, it can cost a lot of money and soft and hard costs to, to replace somebody. So making a, a timely decision and an informed decision helps everybody. Okay, so now is the time for exciting questions that you may have for me. Um, we, I, some of you may be been, have been holding on to your questions um, until the end. Some of you may be, um, uh, some of you may be wondering, um, you know, I have a question I'd like to ask you later. Um, you know, we'll get back to anybody who we don't get the questions, um, uh, we don't get the questions covered for um, today. Um, so I'm going to just take a look here. Okay, so one of our questions is, um, you know, do I tell the candidate the truth about why I didn't select them? I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, it's we all want to help everybody, right? We want to be sure that we are giving them an opportunity, um, you know, to improve, even if they're not the right candidate for you, that they're a good candidate um, for someone else. But we do want to be careful about the language that we're using when we tell them, sorry, we didn't select you. So I think it's always best to say, you know, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, we went with another candidate that had more experience. We would love to see you um, in another position potentially. Please, you know, keep us, you know, on your radar. We'd like to see, you know, another application from you in the future. Um, because being too honest sometimes can hurt you. Um, one, it can hurt you in the marketplace. Again, one candidate tells 10 candidates, so you don't want that. But also, um, they could misconstrue your constructive criticism for uh, a discriminatory practice. And we don't want that. So we want to be very cautious in the type of, of um, conversations that we're having and when we're asking them um, what it is. But that's a good question. Okay, got another question. Would it be better to assign the same person to interview the candidates with a witnessing supervisor? I think it is good to have uh, the same person seeing all the candidates. Um, team interviews can be very useful, especially if it's a team environment that they're going to be working in. Um, I think it's good to have a single point of contact for um, for a hiring because then you're getting the same 
um, again, you've got consistency there. So I think that that's really important. Um, and basing on this question, it seems like maybe they're not typically a hiring manager, and so that's why they would have a witnessing supervisor. I think that that's where it's going. But um, I, I think team interviews are really good. I think that that is typically a second stage interview, um, just because the supervisor or the hiring manager has already made that determination that they are the best candidate. Um, you know, these are my top three candidates. I'm going to have the team interview them and see which one fits best for them. So, yes, I think it's good to have this a single point of contact for an interview um, for a position. But um, I do think that it is important to include a team, especially if it's a close knit team and they're going to be working together. Um, you know, it's also a great skill set for uh, everyone to start learning how to do um, on your team. So it's a good growth opportunity. So hopefully that answered your question. Let's see if I have any additional questions. I think we are actually running out of time. So we may have to um, get back to you on these questions, which I absolutely will do. Um, anybody who has submitted a question, I will definitely um, reach out to you and answer it um, for you and make sure that you have um, all of the information that you need. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed our presentation today. I thank you for joining me on this journey. Um, and thank you so much uh, for joining us today.